Welcome to the Science of Parenting Podcast, where we connect you with research-based information that fits your family. We all talk about the realities of being a parent and how research can help guide our parenting decisions. I'm Mackenzie Johnson, parent of two littles with their own quirks, and I'm a parenting educator. And I'm Lori Cordles, and I am a parent of three in two different life stages. Two are launched, one is still in high school, and I am also a parenting educator. And today we're going to continue season seven talking about temperament. Yes. And also we are giggly because our producer Mackenzie DeYoung is messing with us (laughs) on our (laughs) end. She was like goofing around with us. So, okay. My apologies. I'm going to focus. I'm not distractible. (laughs) No. (laughs) That's not a temperament trait that I have. (laughs) Absolutely not. No. Uh, Oh, so yeah. This season we do, we're going to look at kind of pushing together a couple of our other seasons, right? Exactly. So we're going to take season three, which was on temperament, season five, which was the ages and stages that children develop in. And all season long, we're going to talk about a specific age, layer on some temperament and see what kind of tips and tricks and techniques we can share with you. And today we are going to kick it off by talking about infants. Babies. There we go. (laughs) I literally have people come up to me if you haven't if that voice does not sound familiar to you and like, Hi, when you're talking about babies I don't know that's just like what the babies and I have people come up to me like oh the babies and I'm like okay, yeah, I'm ridiculous I get it <laughs> no, it we're happy to have people chat with us about any of it we are oh, yes but babies today and we're going to be looking at kind of one specific question around babies right we are yes what is my baby telling me mm. Yes. <laughs> but you like challenge. the 10 million dollar question, right? Oh. What are they telling me? <laughs> yes. But that temperament does give us insight into understanding that like yes. crying is one form of communication, but we're going to talk about that there's lots of other forms that are mm-hmm. happening that temperament influences. Yes, so many forms. Yes. And yes. before we do that, we got to talk for just a second, a little reminder, um as like I said, as every parenting textbook ever has mentioned, Parenting is a bi-directional process. Mm -hmm. We influence our kids, but our kids influence us in the way that we parent, right? Which is why one child might pull this certain thing out of us while another one seems to pull this certain other thing out of us if we have multiple children. So, But this idea that our kids' characteristics, like their temperament, like their birth order, like their gender Mm -hmm. identity, like their health status, all this other stuff, that that's going to influence how we parent, how what kind of child rearing we do, what how we behave, how we interact, how we communicate. And so we know that it's not just about who I am as a parent that influences my parenting, but also who my kid is that's going to influence my parenting. So temperament's a yes. huge part of that. It is, absolutely. So let's just start off with a quick reminder, uh, reintroduce the definition. We're going to do it just a little bit each week, just to keep everyone on the same page. But Mary Rothbart and her colleagues are where we get our definition from. They talk about temperament being a physiological basis for individual differences. So the differences in how our body, our internal body responds, reacts, how it is able to self-regulate, Um, Even things like motivation and affect and activity and attention, all of those things are a part of temperament. Um, One of our favorite temperament researchers, Mary Sheedy Kursinka, talks about temperament as um, helping us to predict. And she says that learning our temperament offers us predictability, a chance to how our children can react, act, Uh, to different people, places, and things that they come across. And we can eventually start to identify and predict their reactions. Essentially, she says that the genes, those biological pieces, are the template. And then the environment, which is our responses to our children, where they grow up, essentially provides us opportunities for learning how to manage their responses, our responses, and how they can manage their responses and our responses. Oh yeah. And that thinking of that word picture you gave us last week of like temperaments at the core and temperament Mm -hmm. is a gift. And then around that gift, right. Is the wrapping paper and the tissue paper and the bows and the card and all that extra stuff. The environment has all these extra layers, but that the temperament is always at the core. And, you know, I think you, as you talk about getting to know those cues and those temperament traits. And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge as we talk about babies in particular, that 
when your baby is forced birth, ooh, first born, <laughs> maybe I need sleep. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. When your baby is first born, we don't know yet, right? You mm -hmm. spend those first few weeks and months learning your baby's temperament, learning yeah. their patterns of reaction because they don't have a pattern yet because this might be the first day or the first right. week or the first yes. month. And so we haven't figured those out yet. And so I think that's a really important part of that's unique about temperament and babies mm -hmm. is you're really spending those first few weeks and months figuring out what those really are. So like, it's okay. Right. We say mm -hmm. it can help you predict, but like, if you've only known this baby for a week, yeah, can't predict a lot yet. And that's okay. That's exactly. Okay. 100 learning curve period. There is a huge learning curve. Yes. So for sure, let's talk about learning in infants in particular. Yes. So in season three, we utilize the CDC milestones tracker. And we're going to go back to that as our basis for rediscovering what it is that infants who we are talking about at this point in time are ages zero to one year. What kind of skills are they learning during that year? Uh, things like taking their first step, maybe smiling, cooing, waving bye bye. These are called developmental milestones. And these are things that most children can do by a certain age, but there's variation. Children vary when they reach those specific milestones. How they learn, how they play, how they speak, all of those things are milestones. And so that's what we're going to talk about specifically alongside temperament. And infants today. Mm, yes. And so, yeah, in addition to those kind of physical milestones, we also see cognitive milestones and language milestones. And, you know, we think about, I, when I, I remember when I took my grad class in child development and thinking about infants that I was like, well, yeah, the crawling, right. And like the walking, right. And the, and all that. And it was like, okay, but there's all this other stuff first. Yeah. Learning that mm -hmm. I impact the world, learning that when I smile, maybe my caregiver smiles back. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much, all this cognitive development that happens alongside those things. Learning, I can reach for a toy. Learning, I, I have fingers, these things that are attached to the ends of these. Yes. Right? <laughs> so all of that's happening. And so, yes, lots of cognitive and brain development. The memory, the language, the thinking, the babbling is a form of language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the mama, the dada, those first words. In our house, ball. Ball. ball was a first word for one. <laughs> but so all of that, the language, the physical, the cognitive. Um, but there's also one really important one that we haven't covered yet, right? One it, domain. There is. And that is a stage where children are learning about trust and they're creating bonds of love with their caregivers. And that's an area that we call social and emotional development. And this is the way that parents cuddle or hold their infant. And all of those things begin to set the basis for how they're going to interact with them. So Thomas and Chess, they really talk about temperament around this idea of a goodness of fit or how do we come together? I like to word picture. Think of it as a puzzle piece. Right. Is this a good fitting puzzle piece with the next piece? And if it's not, how do we adapt? So when we specifically think of babies and that idea of trust and um, relationship and cuddling, what we're doing is as a caregiver, we're matching our ability to communicate with them with their ability to communicate with us and, uh, and interact with us. And what we're looking for is that good flow of interaction and communication back and forth bi-directional from each other. <laughs> Um, yes. And what we're doing is nurturing those interactions and we're encouraging interactions um, that are, are well functioning and just that good fit together. Oh, yes. And, you know, maybe you're if you're newer, a newer listener to the science of parenting or viewer, um, you know, you maybe haven't heard us say it before, but we talk a lot. One of our core beliefs is that parents are the experts on their kids, right? Mm -hmm. That as a caregiver, that you know your kid, that you know their needs, and temperament's a huge part of that. And this goodness of fit that you as a parent are able to create, that's a huge part of why we think parents are the experts, right? You've seen that kid's temperament. You've seen how they interact with the world. And so, yeah, you're the best person to anticipate and make plans and inform the other people around them who care about them, for sure. Absolutely. That goodness Absolutely. of fit and that temperament is just such a huge part of it. 
It is. And research tells us that understanding our child's temperament allows for this back and forth goodness to happen. And yes. we can show our children more emotional regulation. They learn it from us as we respond and interact and, and learn what their cues are and their needs are. So mm -hmm. let's, you know, let's go back to what are the nine traits that Thomas and Chess shared? And we talked a lot about them in season three. So you can go back and specifically grab onto one trait and hear us talk all about it. But we're specifically today going to only address that trait through the lens of infants. And we're going to walk through the nine traits and we're going to share with you, okay, what does this trait look like in an infant? And if you remember, we talk about the traits as a continuum. So each and every one of us, all of our children got all nine traits. We just have to decide and come to learn about how much of each trait did we get? Do we get a lot of activity level or just a little bit? Did we get a lot of intensity or just a little bit? So we'll take a couple at a time. How's that sound? That sounds good. Well, let's dive into these. So I guess I'll get, get going, right? Let's think one of the first uh, temperament traits is activity level. So how physically active, moving your body, things like that. So for an, a less active baby, so a baby with a lower activity level, they might lie quietly while getting dressed. You know, maybe they're staying, they're laid down in one spot and then picked up from the same spot. And I'm like, what is that? Is the that same thing? spot. Oh, that's a thing. Okay. <laughs> uh, it just wasn't a thing for my kids. Um, yeah. But versus that higher activity level, right? Always on the move, whether they're sleeping, whether I think of the term diaper wrestling. <laughs> Yes. As one of my siblings says, it would take two to change a diaper because they were squirming and moving and giggling and all this silliness that was happening. I think another big one, that activity level, a uh, lower, a higher activity level child, those physical milestones like crawling mm -hmm. and walking, that mm -hmm. high activity level can be an asset like that. They might have some of those early, earlier milestones for physical yes. things because they like to practice lots of that. That feels good. They do. Them. Um, the next trait being approach or withdrawal. So does a child approach things that are new? Do they enjoy novelty, like new people, new situations, new places, or do they tend to withdraw from those new things? So for a baby, for a baby that is particularly more approaching, they might be calm when a new person comes and goes in to tickle their belly and do baby talk mm -hmm. and all those little things that people do, or, you know, that they, you don't really notice a difference for their behavior when they're in a new place or unfamiliar place at the, for a baby that's high approach, that, that kind of stuff, it doesn't feel like it really quote unquote messes with your baby versus a baby that's more withdrawing. This is the baby that maybe doesn't like to be passed. I had two mm -hmm. babies that did not want to be passed around from person to person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they might be distressed by new things that things felt fearful. I even think of people when you're like, we have a dog and when people introduce their baby to our dog, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, does your baby like, Ooh, a dog <laughs> or yes. is, is your baby more fearful? Mm -hmm. Um, and so that can be a thing. How does your baby approach things that are new? Are they approaching or withdrawing? And I remember coming to your house for the first time after your first child was born and, and we met at the door and yes. you immediately started to say, now she might not want to be held. And I thought, okay, she's apologizing and she's oh, wait, wait, we're gonna we're gonna have to teach her about temperament because she's gonna have to apologize <laughs> for this baby not wanting to be held by some perfect stranger who just showed yes. up at the door i was saying um, but i will say that temperament served you in a way that maybe wasn't serving other people in my life like sure. that you were like oh that's your baby's temperament it's okay if she doesn't like to be held by new people that's okay that you could yes. understand that and be like, Hey, what's wrong with you or your baby? Yeah. I'll sit here and yeah. chat with you and you can hold your baby and I'll just look at her <laughs> longingly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that kind of leads us into this third trait adaptability and adaptability in infants. It might look like an infant who can fall asleep quickly or calmly. Um, and if they are woke up awakened, they might be calm when they are awakened. <laughs> Uh, versus the child who is not adaptable, who, you know, maybe is not ready to be done feeding. And if they are awakened from their sleep, they might cry um, or begin to fuss. 
you know, they're just not adaptable to those quick changes, whether it's the yeah. car seat or, um, you know, getting in and out of a big snowsuit or coat. They, those types of things they're not comfortable with. Yes. The uh, transitions, and those sure. transitions, I think of those right? Transitions of like in and out of the car seat, in and out of yes. the crib, held to laying down. Like, yes, yes. Is that something that your baby does fine with? Like if, if you're like, what are they talking about? You probably have a more adaptable baby. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> if you're like, no, my baby cries no. the second that every the time the car seat pull comes out. Yes. Yes. And so how do we learn to appreciate that, right? Um, so another trait that kind of drives right into this is intensity. So they're not adaptable, right? Then what is their intensity level? And when it comes to expressing their displeasure about having to adapt, um, a less intense infant might be easily soothed. They might just have softer cries. Um, they are not going to get upset when they're surprised um, or challenged, right? Uh, where a, a more intense infant um, they might not enjoy tummy time because that is mm. challenging to them and they don't mm. want to have anything to do with that. And they're going to express that loudly uh, when they are upset. They might have loud cries and they might have these loud, huge belly laughs when they learn to yes. laugh. That intense, yes. that intense baby is really hot and cold at the same yes. time, right? Hot, cold, immediately. <laughs> Woo. Well, and yeah. I think of like when an, I don't remember which of our kids it was, I was with somebody else. And I remember hearing their baby cry was just like this sweet little whimper. It was just like, oh. and I was like, what is that noise? <laughs> because when my baby cried, it was a whale, right? So like, and when it comes to intensity, I think, is there a whimper or is there a whale? Yes. <laughs> when there's yes. tears. Yes. Uh, a few other traits. Uh, one being sensitivity. And so think of the sensory information mm. that your baby receives, noise, um, mm -hmm. smells, textures, right? Like a wet diaper, that feeling of things like that, lights that are bright. And so you might have a less sensitive baby who can sleep through noisy routines. I remember, you know, I've heard somebody talk about, I could vacuum under the crib <laughs> while they were sleeping. I was like, that child, yes. that baby was not very sensitive. Versus <laughs> some babies wake the second they're laid down, right? They feel that cold sheet or, yes. right? The, the, the bright lights can be overstimulating. Mm -hmm. The noise in the place can be overstimulating. Yes. So sensitivity is a big part of that. Uh, and I'm, then laughing. Of I'm laughing and chuckling <laughs> because I was just remembering my oldest daughter, Okay, so so back in the day, we had those little cassette recorders that were black, and you just put the yes. cassette in, and right, you had to flip it to make yes. it play the other side. So she had a specific bedtime tape cassette. Uh -huh. I know people are like, "What?" No, um, I know, I know. What's and so and so, I would sometimes I would hear that last song, and I would sprint in there and shut it off very quietly because she was so sensitive to loud noise that when that cassette turned off oh, got to the end of that the, tape it would go like really yeah. super loud and she'd ah! and I'd be like so i'd sprint in there on that last song and just quietly put that on there. and then she'd stay asleep oh <laughs> gosh that is funny that is funny no. well and then that kind of closely ties also to this trait of distractibility or mm -hmm. perceptiveness or alertness um but that some babies really aren't bothered don't notice too much you know things like light or they yes. can sleep or feed anywhere uh, versus a baby that's more distractible or more in tune with the details around them. You know, I had what I we call the FOMO baby. Yeah. Uh, one of my kids, right? Fear I of missing out. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. Thank you. The fear of missing <laughs> out, baby. I can't nurse while we are around these people. I have to yes. see everything. Like, mm -hmm. I cannot sleep here. I'm going to need to stay awake. Yes. That, yes. Yeah, needing very specific set of, in, like, the environment to be a specific way to help them because all those things are just way too enticing. Right. So having it dark needing to like be away from the commotion or staying awake in those unfamiliar places might be yes. signs of a more alert and perceptive baby. Mm -hmm. I love that word alert. That's what Mary Shee Krasinka uses when she talks about distractibility uh, in her books. Yes. And she talks about, you know, what is their level of alertness? What do they catch? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so then let's talk about persistence. I think we're on a temperament trait seven. So yes. persistence, if you've been counting. Um, so the persistent infant 
uh, they cannot be redirected. The persistent infant, if you take a toy away from them, they want it back. A persistent infant who's crawling towards that potted plant uh, cannot be just quickly picked up and turned around and you know, they will go back. They, they will go back <laughs> to that potted plant versus the less persistent infant. Um, you know, they're not necessarily going to want that toy back, but they're also not necessarily going to continue with a hard task. So, you know, they might just try to scoot a little and that was good enough. That's kind of hard. Um, yeah. I'll try that a different day. And so, you know, depending on that persistence of your infant, uh, your baby, it, there are different things you can and like you can get away with as a parent and other things where you're just like, how come that parent can just turn their baby around and look at something different and they stop crying, right? <laughs> yes. They don't have to like play like box yes. out goalie against the potted plant yes. and I am going to have to yes. stay here all day. <laughs> exactly. They get to keep their magazines on the coffee table. <laughs> yes. And I remember putting a box in front of the stairs at our, yes. like, at our previous home. That was what, like we didn't have a gate yet. We were waiting for the gate to get there mm -hmm. and we had this big box because it was like, they're like, well, just don't let her go on the stairs. I'm like, then I would have to sit there all day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. Well, just, we'll talk about that later. We'll just, yeah, sure. <laughs> and, okay. So, uh, temperament trait number eight is regularity. Uh, and we didn't put these in any particular order, but this is one of my very favorites to talk about because like I said, in episode, oh gosh, can't remember of season three, uh, about when we regularity, about regularity, <laughs> it was about, you know, do babies eat, sleep and poop at the same time every day? And a very regular baby will like, mm -hmm. you know what time it is based on the smell in the room, right? The diaper <laughs> needs to be changed. It must be 1137, yes. um, you know, or they're hungry and you know that, yeah, it's their 333 snack. Um, the, the infant who is regular can follow what the books say that all of your friends give you, right? And you feel successful and you feel like you won the day because look, they followed what the book said. The irregular infant is not going to follow what the book said. They don't sleep at the same time every day. They don't sleep for the same amount every day. Um, they aren't going to eat the same amount. They're not going to eat on schedule, no matter how committed you are to that book that your best friend gave you that worked like a charm for her, that irregular infant, their temperament is going to buck you at every turn. They just yes. are going to listen to their own biological rhythms, the genes that someone gave them. I don't know if it was you or not, but mm. someone gave them those mm. biological genes to help them create their biological rhythms. And so regularity is one of those temperament traits that, gosh, adults so want to control, especially in infants. And, oh, yeah. and so wrapped into my success as a parent, if I get them to eat, sleep and poop when I want them to. But temperament rules especially in regularity <laughs> temperament is at the core at the core yes. it's in the middle of that gift bag <laughs> <laughs> yes and i you know i think of so i have one kid that was a clock like i yeah you talk about mm -hmm. i but he would cry and i would be like it must be three o'clock he's hungry he's ready to eat and sure enough like so he was the clock but my daughter was not my daughter was not a clock baby Yes. Uh, Mary Sheedy Christinka talks about some kids are clocks and, but some kids can be clocks, but especially with spirited babies, they tend to be more based around cues, like routines. Yes. What are their sleepy cues? Things like that. Yes. Um, and I think of thinking about temperament as the gift in that yes. gift wrap, um, as an infant, that was really hard for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very irregular too. So I felt like at least I had that going for me like, Oh, you're staying up. Okay. I guess I could stay up kind of thing. But seeing it now that my irregular kid is the kid that can stay up till midnight for a wedding because she wants yeah. to dance all night um yeah but like her irregularity is a gift in a lot of ways for me as a parent and that like oh we could stay a little longer because she doesn't you know like it'll be mm -hmm. all right if she's up a little late she can handle that with her temperament it but yeah it is it's different to have an irregular baby than it, it is. is to have a regular one and you're so right that the judgment others and that we put on ourselves of like, Oh, cool. Your baby sleeps through the night. Mine doesn't. What's wrong with me? Yes. Like, What's wrong with me? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Nothing's wrong nothing. With me. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there is one more temperament trait here and that's mood. 
So whether kind of the general disposition that a baby or a person has. And so for an infant that has high mood, typically in a good mood, you're getting maybe you're getting lots of those smiles and giggles. Um, they e might be in a fairly good mood even when they didn't sleep, right? I even think mm -hmm. there were times I remember being like, how are you so happy? I'm exhausted. <laughs> we were yes. awake all night. Why are you so happy? Yes. <laughs> that, that might be high mood. <laughs> yes. Uh, versus a baby with a lower mood, right? We know, all of us know people that tend to be a little more serious. Yes. That maybe are a little more somber in their disposition. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of things that we recognize about that in adults. And that can be the case with babies too, right? Yes, that they, exactly. Maybe they're not the like giggly, but they are the thoughtful, the yes. looking around. Um, as Mary Sheedy Krasinka says it, uh, an old an old soul and an infant body. Yeah. And so I there are that. absolutely babies that are just, yeah, that lower mood can, I hate to use the word fickle because I think that has a negative connotation yeah. to it, but that, yeah, some babies aren't the gigglers and that there's mm -mm. nothing wrong with that. There's so many beautiful gifts wrapped up in that temperament, even if they're yes. not particular. Exactly. So in the spirit of what is my baby telling me, right, <laughs> let's talk about the reality. And we really, this season, we wanted to pull research in different areas that might be particularly challenging at specific ages, right? So yes. those things that cause parents to go surf the internet at 2 a.m., those are the things that we wanted to focus on. And Jesus. so... For babies, that really honestly was communication because they can't communicate verbally, right? Yes. But they're communicating with us in all of these other ways. And, and so we wanted to try to give you something to help answer that question. What is my baby telling me? Um, and yes. one thing that you can do is go back to season three. Um, we have some specific information from McCall Gordon on sleep. Um, and we also have information from Mary Sheedy Krasinka on her new book, Raising Your Spirited Baby. And so what we want to do is take this time to share some reality around what Mary talks about in her book. And she specifically talks about um, three different types of babies. So she talks about a low-key baby, a spunky baby, and a spirited baby. And then we're going to talk about what she calls the three cues for arousal. Three zones. Three zones. Oh, Cues. Yeah. Oh boy. How about <laughs> cues are right. Cues are what cues we're going right. to see yeah. in the zones. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cues, zones. Yes. All of the it. zone. That, watch the cue. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so let's go backwards. Uh, so what is a low key infant? So a low key infant is the infant that says, you know what? I am so mellow, but don't forget because my needs can actually be overlooked. And then she talks about a spunky baby. And the spunky baby is that one that's relatively mellow, but they do have their temperament triggers, right? And then we talk about the spirited baby. And so I just want to actually read a little bit of this from her book because I think it's so well stated. Um, the spirited baby says, I need you to help me stay calm. So please respond quickly before I become too upset. That's the key there. Please respond quickly before I come too upset because spirited babies are intense. Every reaction is strong and powerful. A mere click of a closing door may awaken them. They're busy and on the move and keeping them safe is a constant challenge. And if you feel like you're working harder than your peers whose babies are not spirited, Mary says you are correct. Yes. But Life with a spirited infant can also be filled with lots of joy. So let's talk about those zones, the zones. cues that are in the zones for arousal. How about you kick us off? Yes. And so looking at these three zones, these are, you look at the cues. <laughs> look at the cues you, in the zones. <laughs> in which zone they're in. So the, she talks about the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone. So in the green zone, you've got a pretty calm baby. Even if your baby is spirited and your baby's intense and at high activity level, but that a baby in the green zone, regardless of their temperament, is still fairly calm um, mm -hmm. and fairly easygoing. In the yellow zone, these are signs that your baby's starting to get what we call dysregulated, right? Mm -hmm. They're start, they're going to need something or they're starting to try to tell you they're going to need something, right? Like, I'm going to need fed. I'm going to need change. I'm going to need help. I'm going to need sleep. Uh, but the yellow zone is going to communicate some of those cues to you. And then the red zone 
this is fully dysregulated. I am overtired. I am starving. Mm -hmm. I am terribly cold, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> something is awful. Um, and then my yeah, cuddle that... bucket is empty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that things are in the red zone, things are looking tense. And I can tell you, very familiar with the red zone. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, I've spent a lot of time there myself as well as with my infants. <laughs> One in particular. But I will say the gift of temperament. Yes, that idea of joy that my child that was a difficult or that we had trouble with sleeping and eating and all of those things with that spirited temperament was also my baby that I have so many videos of her giggling, belly yeah. laughing, exploring, climbing all over all of those yes. things that there is so much all wrapped together in that package of temperament for sure. Yes. So first I want to tell you some of the things about the green zone of arousal. Okay. What are some of the things you see when a baby, any baby is in the green state of arousal. So they're probably, I, I have my book here in front of you, me literally looking at Mary Sheedy Christina's <laughs> Raising Your Spirited Baby book, but things like they're looking at you, that they're engaged with you, they're engaged in play, they might be exploring. Uh, something that interesting that she has here is their movement can be more smooth, right? So it's not like that. jerky and fidgety, but that like I'm reaching and it's just a thing that that's happening naturally for me. Um, they might mimic, you know, if you clap, they mm -hmm. clap, right? They're playing those older babies, things like that. They're giggling, they're bright eyed, right? I think of that was one thing I learned with my infants was their eyes, how much their yes. eyes were telling me. And people told me that and I was like, I don't get it. Um, but the bright eyed versus the blank stare mm -hmm. that comes and then the blank stares almost turns into like a scowl later in the red zone. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so that idea of that they're calm, they're collected, they're smiling, they're exploring. This is, this is of course, the ideal. This is when your baby has all of their needs met. Yes. They're in the green zone. Green zone. Mm -hmm. and, and as you think about these zones, think about this as your baby's communication. They're yes. communicating with you. And then when they move into the yellow zone, this is kind of that space where they're beginning to say, hey, can you pay attention to me because I am starting to need something. Right. I'm starting to communicate with you. So they might turn away from you or lose interest in what's going on around them and start to become a little frustrated with it. Or they might seek contact with you. Um, if you if you've laid them down in the middle of the floor, they might say start to indicate they want you to come closer. Uh, like Mackenzie was talking about movements, those smooth stroking movements might become more um, agitated or kicking or accelerated. And those bright eyes might start to frown or they might purse their lips or begin to grimace uh, or they start to blink like they I'm, I know I'm starting to blink right now. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, like, not blink. I'm doing all these things. Right. Um, <laughs> but they're starting to tell you things. And these are the things I love to observe out in public mm -hmm. with infants is I can start to see when those babies are moving into that yellow zone just by these cues. They're starting to pucker that eyebrow. Or they might even start to rev up or hum and make sounds like I'm starting to need something. And <laughs> yes, they might want to be fed or, you know, go for that special thing um, that makes them feel more comfort. Yes. And so those are the signs, right? Our babies are communicating, right? Absolutely. Like our babies are telling us, I'm going to like, I'm needing something. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, mama. Hey, hey dada. Hey, uh, ball. <laughs> right. <laughs> ball, dog. <laughs> I'm needing something um, is in that yellow zone that they're starting to get a little dysregulated with whatever they're feeling versus the red zone, right? Where we're full fledged. The needs Oof. are urgent and your baby is having a hard time. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the crying, right? Which yes. honestly for me, that was a really hard balance for me to find with my kids of like, okay, well, don't pick them up before they even cry. Like, don't wake them up because you thought they were going to cry. Mm -hmm. Like, versus, okay, but once they're crying, they're in the red zone. Mm -hmm. And so there is, there's a balance there that can be tough. Um, also acknowledging the movement, you know, the stiffness in their body. Yes. So arching their back, tightly closed fists. That's one I remember you talk, talking to me about was their little tight fists and what their fingers mm -hmm. are communicating um their stiff body becoming red in the face Ooh. pulling up their knees which to me mm -hmm. is just like so biologically interesting because you think about babies in the womb all yes. scrunched up that your baby <laughs> is scrunching 
right? Yes. They're getting nice Put me and back. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, some other things being, you know, scrunching up their face, flaring their nostrils, um, screaming, right? Some of our older Ugh. infants that are able to actually scream. But another one that I find interesting, and I see this in myself as well as in my spirited daughter, is this becoming the hyper and the frenzied. Mm -hmm. So like so overtired or whatever it is that it's people are they don't look tired at all. It's like, right. They're but they so are, like, tired. But they are. They're so yeah. overtired. So yes. that's a big one. And honestly, even the super needy baby um, yeah. is telling you I'm tired. I'm hungry. Yes. Um, I actually we were with friends recently and they were doing something with their with their well, I guess now a little over one, I guess. But um, I offered to hold the baby and they're like, oh, yeah. And they were getting ready to eat something. So I was like, I could hold your baby if you want. And baby immediately was like, no, no, no. And they're like, I'm so sorry. I totally expected I could pass him. Normally that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you must be tired. I'm like, that's awesome that you recognize mm -hmm. your baby's needs, right? Yes. That you're like, hey, that baby's telling me that they're not ready. And I, you know, I tried to be as like, oh, that is awesome. Yes. Great work. I'm so glad that you listened to your baby and that your baby knows what it needs. Exactly. Um, I thought that was a beautiful thing that that yes. baby was doing. So yes, yeah. those three zones of green, yellow, and red. And that, yeah, there's zones that yes. have cues. <laughs> they have, these zones have cues and they're telling you something. Your baby is telling you something in the green zone. They're telling you all is well. It's all yeah, good all here. Good. And, and the yellow zone, they're starting to say, I'm, I'm struggling. Please help. Mm -hmm. and in the red zone, they're saying, I am overloaded and I need major assistance to calm down. Yes. Like I need your help to calm down. And so as we look at temperament, especially in infancy, what we begin to recognize is they're giving off these cues and the amount of time we have in each zone is what we begin to understand based on their predictability as we learn about temperament. So yes. predicting how much time we have between zones short. becomes super important. <laughs> right? For some kids, it's longer, medium, short, right? Yes. And that is based on their temperament. Those biological, physiological things that are happening inside of them are giving us cues and we can predict, whoa, I got 43 and a half seconds and that's it. <laughs> yes. Or I have enough time to sprint across the room and grab at their blanket and be back, mm -hmm. right? Yes. That's and I think of the key. Yes. Well, and I think of the times that I was in situations knowing that I had a baby that had a very short window between yellow and red. Yes. And I had another baby that was much like that. We had more time, but there was yes. more flexibility there. But knowing that and the people were like, oh, do you really need to go? Like, and I remember the judgment and the feeling of like, oh, you know, yeah. and not knowing. But then now I look back and I'm like, but I knew mm -hmm. my baby. Like, yes, but we did. My co-parent and I really did know that timeline was short and I knew how hard it was for me once they fell apart. Yes. Um, you know, so I wish I could go back and tell younger parent me to say, like, yeah. you know what you're doing. And that's one of the things we believe mm -hmm. at the science of parenting is like with this temperament, with these zones of arousal, with all those things, you can learn better than anybody else, how, what your baby's cues are, how much time you have, all those things. But like you and your co-parent know your baby. Absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. I love that. Trust yourselves. Uh, Trust like yourself. I was gonna, I was gonna, you know, come up with something really, ex you know, really super profound, but that was profound. Trust yourself. <laughs> Trust yourself. Yes. yes. Get yes. to know those cues, and then believe yourself and your baby um, mm -hmm. when they come around. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think that means it's time to bring our producer Mackenzie in and see if she can help us stop and breathe and. Take a moment in this section. Uh, we got to, uh, we gave her a little break in season six and brought her back in season seven. And so we last week her. she was pretty, pretty easy on us with a question. And so I'm, I'm curious this week to see what kind of, what kind of question do you have, Mackenzie? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was texting during this whole thing because I thought I had questions. It's one of those, I thought I had a question and y'all covered all of uh -huh. my questions. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk a little bit more because you, you touched on it and I feel like the answer not didn't necessarily come up around mm -hmm. the idea. So 
you just talked about trusting yourself. We talked about, you know, people have opinions of things and you talk about trusting yourself and knowing your baby. But when you come into that situation with someone who is, you know, the trying to backseat, be the backseat driver <laughs> of your, your baby and the car that you're in of handling a newborn, what kind of things can we start to have conversations around or how can we start to have those conversations with others about like, oh, my baby or mm. um, here's temperament in general or those sorts of things so we can start to educate those around us so that we don't feel that judgment or that we have an You need to talk to my friend Mackenzie, right? I just give the, <laughs> I'll give them her card. Here, you need to talk. <laughs> oh, it's tough. Mm. Uh, that's such a good question. Yes. Okay. There are several parts of me, several things that I'm like, uh, uh, like, can't say <laughs> fast enough. One, as a parent, you don't have to explain those decisions to anybody but your co-parent. Mm -hmm. um, that's a thing that I didn't, didn't sit with me well for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but they're like, you don't need anybody else to agree besides your co-parent. Mm -hmm. And maybe, um, you know, if you have a child care provider, that would be another person that really needs to be on sure. board. But otherwise, so that's one part of it is like, you're allowed to say, I don't need them to understand this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing I want to say. Another one is, yes, those conversations around temperament and helping people around you. You know, even your parents, well-intentioned grandparents, well-intentioned friends, other mm -hmm. friends who are parents whose baby is different than yours, all of those people. Um, but talking about what you know about your baby, um, yes. you know, explaining it in terms of I have seen my baby does this mm -hmm. and this. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes being as forward as saying when because sometimes right, it's just like sometimes it's just hard to have a baby like as wonderful as they are <laughs> and being able to say, like, I really just need you to listen right now. Like what mm -hmm. I really need from someone is to just listen because it is so tempting, especially those of us who've had babies mm -hmm. to be like, Oh, you know what? With my baby. <laughs> I've yeah. been there. Well, my sister did this. Have you tried right. this? <laughs> yes. The, have you tried it? The, have you yeah. tried it? It's like, yeah. I don't want one more person to tell me about me? that. Like, yes. <laughs> right. Oh, um, I, Oh, yeah. so my middle daughter was, um, super spirited in term in certain different specific ways. And it was, we had a heartbreaking situation where we had to switch caregiving situations and it, it honestly had to do with temperament and her temperament and her neediness yes. and, you know, just her, I always called it her small emotional bucket, like her emotional mm -hmm. bucket emptied very quickly. Yeah. And the care that she was in was super amazing care, except there weren't enough caregivers. Uh, and so in her case, she needed a place that had more than one caregiver because her needs were way too demanding for only one person. Mm -hmm. And so that was hard, so hard to leave a beloved caregiver recognizing that my specific child's temperament needed more than one person available to fill her little emotional bucket. Uh, yes. And that's a hard conversation. And the super cool thing is that, so I had learned about temperament in between my two children. My caregiver actually learned about temperament about six years later through, mm -hmm. like she legitimately took a training in which there was a, an entire eight hour day devoted to temperament. And she came <laughs> yeah. to me from a different state because she had moved. She came to me um, after that training and said, oh my gosh, Lori, I finally now understand what you meant about her temperament and how she needed more than one caregiver. And she goes, that was a hard pill for me to swallow, but I am so glad that you stuck to your decision. And like we repaired a bridge that was broken. It was, it was tough. Yes. But as that young parent, I just knew like she, she needed more than one person. And I knew that my caregiver was going to be happier <laughs> without yes. my baby there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And I think that's right? okay to say, like, it's that okay. is real of like, yeah. it was hard for them yeah. and for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other thing that we're kind of getting at here is we don't always talk about it when we think about parenting education or like what we do with parents, but like your ability to advocate for your baby 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, your ability, that child, the, what are they telling me? You've worked so hard to learn what they're telling you. And so bringing them to a grandparent to watch them for an hour or for overnight yes. or for whatever it is, um, you know, at finding those people in your life who will trust your expertise and then helping teach others and advocate for your baby of, you know what, yes. there's going to be a really short time frame between this and this, or you know what, mm -hmm. she is going to cry and then she's going to scream. Like <laughs> it's going to happen really fast or, yes. you know what, or he's not gonna like, he's, like he's not going to cry. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yes, those, but the, the communication and the advocacy that happens mm -hmm. when you learn about your baby's temperament and to trust yourself and your co-parent. And then, okay, this is kind of a tough one for me to say. I, my husband and I have a great relationship and he's a fantastic parent and co-parent, but it was a hard thing for us to recalibrate. I had maternity leave and he did not have mm. maternity leave. And yeah. so I had spent hours and hours and hours and weeks at home with our baby one-on-one. -on -one. And so yes. it was also a matter when there's not equity and equality in how much time you spend with your baby or the mm -hmm. quality of time you're able to spend. In your co-parenting relationship, that's also a factor. And they're like, I've yeah. been noticing this. Have you seen or right? Like, sure. and so sometimes there's that knowledge sharing of whichever parent has spent more time with, especially when that baby is so new. Yeah. So consider that, you know, that communication and have a plan for it before yeah. you have a baby. If you know how much time you think each of you is <laughs> going to get, um, if you get any, right? Yes. Um, any paid or unpaid kinds yeah. of time. And so think through those that's things great. too. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> that is. That is. Um, yeah, the judgment comes and the conversations come and a lot right. is well intended, right? Like, I, yeah, did exactly. you know if, have you ever thought of? And it's like yes. everybody tells me that. Yes, I, I did. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. So thanks, Ken. That's a great mm -hmm. question. All right. So, so we we've covered we've covered a lot of things today about the babies. I don't think the I can babies. say it right. I can't say it like you. <laughs> <Babies>. <laughs> you know, looking at what are the milestones, what are the things that they are, um, you know, working on and how can we recognize what our part was in giving them those genes, right? And then taking that to a different level of understanding and thinking about that goodness of fit. Uh, what else do we do? Oh, talking about so much. Well, and looking at how those each of those temperament traits plays into the different tasks, right? We talk a lot about sleep. Temperament mm -hmm. is a huge factor in how babies sleep, but also feeding and all of those things. So we did, we walked through those nine traits and whether you have, you know, we talked about spirited babies, but whether you have low key spunky or spirited temperament is a factor in how you mm -hmm. parent for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So next week, we're going to talk about toddlers and their developmental yes. milestones and how temperament plays into some of those, um, really big feelings that they have, right? Yes. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll myth bust some of those <laughs> challenges that toddlers have. Yes, but please. Thanks for coming along with us at the Science of Parenting and be sure to follow us weekly on Facebook and watch us on your feed. Yes, yes, anywhere in your social media. Please do come along with us as we tackle the ups and downs, the ins and outs, and the research and reality all around the science of parenting. The Science of Parenting is hosted by Lori Kothals and Mackenzie Johnson, produced by Mackenzie DeYoung, with research and writing by Barbara Dunn Swanson. Send in questions and comments to parenting at iastate.edu and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu/slash diversity/slash ext.